Hey guys, welcome to the video. If you clicked on this, I am sure you've probably watched all the GR Corolla videos or possibly are on the internet right now and mine popped up here late. The reality is I wanted to spend some time with the car and get to know it so I can actually give you guys details of the car that, you know, first time impressions can't really give you. And so this is the video for the person who wants to buy the car and actually know what they're getting themselves into. So with all that being said, let's get into it. So here we are in the Corolla interior, and more or less, it's what you would expect. You do get a relatively nicely equipped Corolla hatchback interior like the regular XSE. However, there are some GR appointments which make this feel slightly more special. First things first, the steering wheel in front of you, and gotta tell you, it is a nice welcome change to just have a regular steering wheel versus a square steering wheel or a flat bottom steering wheel or a yoke or something else. And also, this steering wheel here is actually, it's a nice shape. It's got a good girth to it, just, just right. Um, I do like the material they use, the leather, and uh, the stitching's really cool too. Um, not too much. The horn here is interesting because it actually, super, <laughs> super sensitive, but the horn sound itself is actually kind of puny. So maybe that's an upgrade point, but something to note. Other than that, Let's talk about these seats because I think that is the other um, special uh, GR touch here. These seats look really good. They have a racing design to them. However, in practice, they kind of just feel like average rent-a-car seats. Um, I hate to say that, but that's really the truth. They do have even these holes here for like what looks like a, like racing harnesses or something, but you would never use these with racing harnesses. Um, the thing about them is they do look like they have bolstering, but the bolstering is not enough. I mean, I'm 6'1", 6'2", about 225 pounds, and I move around in these seats all the time. Like if I'm going through corners, yeah, they just don't hold you tight. Um, so from that perspective, it's annoying. But on the other hand, these are really comfortable and really daily drivable, livable seats. So kind of depends on what you want. My only other gripe with these seats is they use the stock XSC like, floor on here, right? And as you would expect, I mean, this is basically the same shell as a regular hatchback Corolla, which also means that they just plopped these seats in the same spot the regular uh, Corolla hatch uh, seats go. Now, what that means is they're actually elevated, and even though this is a manual adjustable seat, you can't really get the seat low enough to feel like you're driving in the car versus on the car. Yes, I, I have enough room, I think, for a helmet, but I just need like an extra inch, inch and a half. So that's just not here, uh, and that's a little bit annoying. Um, other than that, you do get a, uh, a nice shifter um, specific to this car. I'm running the Morito shift knob, which is a nice piece with a little bit of Alcantara on it. Uh, that is extra. Um, but uh, nevertheless, it's a good positive throw and it feels good. Now, I do have a couple of gripes though. For starters, the stereo <laughs> in this car is the JBL system. It's just not very good. Uh, just to level set expectations, I, I can't stand it. It really, um, it makes me want to upgrade. However, upgrading your speakers means adding weight 
because magnets are really, really heavy. So I think Toyota took that into account because they're balancing, yes, they're balancing cost, but they're also balancing performance. Uh, and they wanna make sure that they opted on the side of uh, performance versus uh, having everything be luxury and premium. The other thing is this touch screen. I gotta say, it is nice placement, but the touch screen itself is very, um, it, it just feels like it's about five years behind. It, it's not very responsive. Uh, the graphics on it are not good. Um, the apps are okay though. I will say app wise, these are pretty good. And ultimately, I think that, um, you know, they're, there's just not a lot to this infotainment system. I'm never gonna use the navigation, but it's nice that it's there. Oh, there is one more thing. So this mirror here is the frameless mirror and it has the home link system in it. So you can basically open and close your garage door. I gotta tell you from every car I've ever owned, this thing works the best. You basically just tap it like once, just even a slight tap. The garage door goes up, no problem each and every time, it's never missed a beat. And uh, even from a distance, it's actually really impressive. I don't know why it's so good, but my other cars have always struggled. Sometimes I'm like sitting there hitting it a lot and nothing's happening, but with this, amazing. So if that's important to you, you're good. All right, so everything you guys have seen online in other videos, I'm sure, um, are all probably pretty accurate. Meaning like the car itself is um, well balanced, it has pretty good power, um, it handles well, all those things are true. On top of that, the steering is good, the drive modes are appropriate and feel good, uh, the car is very tossable, it feels like it is built well. All those things are 100% true. Now for the things that you probably won't hear in those reviews. So the first thing is the screen here in front of me, the little digital gauge, gives me the option to choose between a number of different menus. And as a driver, there's some of this stuff, the, the, the data itself is actually helpful. So for example, I'd like to know what my tire temperatures are at all times to make sure, especially when I'm driving hard, that I don't have a flat and uh, potentially don't cause an accident. But you know what? If I set that menu and then turn off the car and then turn it back on, that menu's gone. It's hidden away somewhere and I have to reset it. Um, and the weird thing is it's totally random. Sometimes it'll be on the, uh, like it'll be there as I set it. If I, I find like, if you shut the car off and you're just gone for like an hour and you come back, it, it coin flip if it's still there or not. But typically you're gonna find that it disappears. So if you want it, you gotta set it for the session and then expect to do it again later on. That is a bug and I don't know how they fix it. It's gonna have to be some sort of update. I don't think it's, I don't even think this car has over the air update available, but anyway, it is definitely an update that needs to happen. Secondly, the shifter is cable actuated. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that there's no transmission directly underneath here. Transmission is up front, which is, um, you know, sitting perpendicular to the car and just like a front wheel drive car. Now, you shift by moving these cables, which changes the gear positioning and changes gear. The problem is when you do so, every so often you will find that you'll grind a gear. And before people start roasting me in the comments, trust me, I've been driving stick shift for, I don't know, almost my whole life. <laughs> and like no joke, almost my whole life. On top of that, um, I've only actually ever had this problem in one other car that I've owned, which was a EP3 Honda Civic Si. Guess what? That one was cable actuated. So what is the moral of the story here? Cables, you know, they just over time, they stretch. Um, also, they're just not gonna be as accurate as, you know, a direct link. 
I mean, that's just the, the reality of the situation. So you have to be very purposeful with your shifts and you have to be patient when you come up off the clutch. Not something that people think about, but uh, once you grind the gears once or twice, you're gonna realize you kinda have to account for it. And that's uh, a little annoying. So let's talk drive modes. Sure, you can go 60-40, 50-50, 30-70, pick your poison, how you feel, how you feel like driving in that moment for that situation. Sounds great, doesn't it? Well, it is. Although, if you're just putting around town, you almost can't tell the difference between those drive modes. Those drive modes really stand out when you utilize the car for the situation they were designed for. So, you know, that's kind of an obvious point, but that's just something to consider because I don't always think that everybody interprets that data in that way. Usually people go, oh, wow, I'm gonna be able to drift it or whatever. Not really. Out of the factory, this thing is pretty planted. This has got incredible grip just straight out of the box. And that's great, very safe feeling, gives you a lot of confidence. But if you wanna learn how to slide the car a little bit, you kind of have to use this e-brake. And thank God we've got an e-brake that's just a regular handle. But when you pull up on it, what happens is it actually disengages the rear tires or the rear um, differential, I should say, through the clutch packs. And by doing so, it allows the back end to slow and be able to uh, brake traction. Um, but you're not gonna be doing that much. But here's the weird thing. The weird thing is this thing is marketed as a trackable fun car and it is all those things. It's actually, I feel like it really punches above its weight, but it has one major Achilles heel. Cause of course it does. Well, clutch packs, they overheat. And Toyota did not do a very good job of accounting for that. So if you go to the track or you go to a autocross or maybe even on a back road, if you're in a particular mode that is gonna really heat up the oil on those clutch packs, what happens is next, you're gonna go into limp mode, which means you're now front wheel drive. And that just kind of stinks, right? Because you bought this car thinking, I'm gonna be able to drive this car every day. It's a Toyota, it's reliable. And yet, I'm gonna be able to have fun with it and not have any worries. I mean, for crying out loud, Toyota literally gives you a free track day when you buy this car with NASA. So, you know, it was a little bit of a surprise uh, to see a lot of people online having this issue. Now, to be fair, I personally have had no issue. And, I don't drive this car slow by any stretch, but again, I've had no issues, zero problems. I think eventually I would though. If I did take it on track, probably a lap or two or three in, you're probably gonna come across it. And I don't think there's a seriously, you know, bulletproof fix that's known yet. There's some other stuff out there that's like, you know, really about adding capacity to the rear diff, which I think it's a clutch pack issue, not a rear diff issue, but anyway, then there's also, you know, different um, fins and stuff that channel air to cool down the gearbox itself. I mean, fine, maybe those things help, but I don't think they're a fix. Another cool thing about this car though, is the sound. Even though it's just a little three cylinder, it, you kind of forget that it's a three cylinder. I mean, I, I typically do forget it. I just drive it, but it's got like two personalities. And I don't mean that in the, you know, the journalistic, oh, it's, you know, a Jekyll and Hyde kind of thing. What I mean is at the low side, let's take the, the, the bottom half RPMs. It actually feels pretty torquey. And I know the, you know, the, the main torque punch is between like three grand and 5,500 RPM, but it really does feel like a lot more um, willing and stuff on that lower end. As you start getting to the higher RPMs, I don't know, it somehow kind of loses a little bit of its tone, it loses a little bit of its eagerness. It almost feels like it's not happy doing that. Um, it'll do it all day, but just doesn't quite feel like 
um, you know, really like high revving, like wants to be driven hard, fast car. Now that being said, it'll do it and maybe it's just something I gotta get used to, but that is something I've noticed. All right, so as an owner, what do I really think about this car? Well, it's not perfect, right? I mean, definitely they could have done a little bit more to make it feel special on the inside. Probably could have put in some uh, higher upgrades to you know, kind of justify the price because these aren't crazy cheap and especially if you add on any dealer markups. But what's really great about this car is that it's actually filling a void. We don't have a great competitor, like a real direct competitor. Sure, you have the, the Type R's of the world and WRX's, but they're just not apples to apples necessarily. This is, this is basically the SDI hatchback from you know, 10 years ago. And I mean, to be honest, I've had that car and I think this one is even more fun to drive. And of course with Toyota reliability and uh, really just an upgraded, very unique modern style, not too much, not too boy racer, but you know, unique that it stands out. I think it's a, a winner. I mean, as long as you can get this car for the right price, I say go for it, you won't regret it. All that being said, guys, thanks for watching at this point. If you have any other questions, concerns, whatever, put them down below. Of course, as always, please share, like, and subscribe, and I'll catch you guys on the next one.